have to recognize that loss and recognize that we are part of that loss as well. And we stand with them. We grieve with them. Tonight, former Mi'kmaq residential school students support their fellow survivors from Kamloops and the ones who never made it home. We were clearly an afterthought and perhaps even an unwelcome intruder in the government's process. The Native Women's Association walks away from the table working on the action plan to end the kidnapping and killing of Indigenous women and girls. If, if I were Indigenous and I had to walk into a school that had something like this name, I'd feel very sad and angry. And changing the name, a group of students erases the name of a residential school advocate from a school in Calgary. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Kamloops, British Columbia, where APTN's Tina House continues to tell the horrific details of what happened at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. A warning, the details may be disturbing to some of our viewers. Cook B. Roseanne Casimir drummed an honor song exclusively for APTN National News in front of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, a place where so many faced severe abuse for years. We still have it still standing because for us that is our history we are not going to wipe away that history we're not going to forget that history because for us most important is knowing who we are where we came from and why we are so resilient and that resiliency is what will get them through as they deal with the enormous tragedy of the 215 innocent children that were found in the mass grave Richard Parent wanted to come and pay his respects to the community after hearing it on the radio. We had been in Germany uh, just before COVID, a uh, year ago, October or something. We went to Dachau and I got that same empty kind of feeling when knowing what happened here. APTN was also given exclusive access to tour the former school. Rose Miller, a former student, says it's not easy to be back here. Rosanna's a field to be walking these halls all these years later. Oh, gives you the heebie-jeebies for sure. So many memories and we're so small trying to look out these windows to see and hoping maybe our parents will come. Little kids used to be crying in the dorms all the time. So would, would it be at these windows here that you would wait and watch for your parents? Yeah, in our bedroom too, if we could even get near the window. Rose later remembered something else about her time at the school while we were in the chapel. And where that black SUV is, right in there was the laundry room. And that's where uh, the incinerator is, where they were burning stuff and we were allowed near there. And it smelled horrible. Cook B, Roseanne Casimir says, there is still a lot of work to do in getting to the truth. We know that through a lot of the um, stories from our ancestors and you know that have attended the residential school that there's a lot of unanswered questions. To Kamloops Sekwekam First Nation is meeting with their community members this week to reveal more details about the shocking discovery here on the former residential school land. Tina House, APTN National News, to Kamloops. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. In the Atlantic region, a Mi'kmaq community gathered Sunday night to remember the 215 children found buried at the former Kamloops Residential School and question if children are buried on the grounds of their former residential school. Angel Moore reports. Elder Ellen Knockwood is a survivor of Shubanagany Residential School. Sunday evening, he returned to the road that leads up to his old residential school with about 100 other people from Sabaganagany First Nation. While he smudged, people tied orange ribbons and teddy bears, all in memory of the 215 children buried at former residential school in Kamloops. Whether it happened 100 years ago, 
our last, our last week. We have to recognize that loss and recognize that we are part of that loss as well and we stand with them, we grieve with them. Up the road from the ribbons and teddy bears is the old residential school. A plastics factory now is at the location. Knockwood says there are children buried at the site. There are three bodies there. Over here is about five. And on the other side of where the school was, on the road I was going to the barn, there's about 10 or 15 more there. What people fail, fail to realize, I don't know, fail to listen. According to Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, ground penetrating radar has been used to search the area and no human remains have been found, but they are still looking. Chief Mike Sack has also heard children may be buried at the site and says finding answers is part of healing. Uh, you know, a lot of community members have always said for a long time and um, I think that we need to make a big push to make sure that we check all of the grounds that are here and, and see what's what, just to put everybody at ease if there is or there isn't. Until more answers are found, makeshift memorials like these will have to do. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Sebaganagadi, First Nation. Now the Alberta government has announced funding to help locate unmarked graves of Indigenous children. Alberta was home to 25 residential schools and the Charles Campbell Hospital in Edmonton, which performed medical experiments on children. While well, no financial numbers have yet been announced, the province says they are following the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in helping to locate the remains of hundreds of children who never returned to their homes. AFN Alberta Regional Chief Marlene Poitras says she is hopeful the real action will start quickly. I'm glad that this work will will commence. You know, it's very important that um, we bring the the re rest of the children, you know, um, home, and and so that uh, the survivors and and the the for, you know the indigenous people across this country can have some closure and uh, and and begin their process of healing. In Calgary, a sign of change. For years, the committee has been after the Board of Education to have the name of the Langevin School replaced. Langevin was one of the creators of residential schools. Now, after the tragedy in Kamloops and the shocked art piece created outside of the school, the board has announced a new name. Tamara Pimentel has that story. After sundown, footprints were spray painted and banners hung outside of Calgary's Langevin School. Monday morning, the public woke to this demonstration, demanding for the name Langevin to be removed. He was an architect of the residential school system. By Tuesday, the Calgary Board of Education announced the school is now called Riverside School. My hope is, is that the community and I think all of Canada now understand the gravity of what we're talking about when we talk about truth and reconciliation. Michelle Robinson is part of a committee spearheaded by non-Indigenous allies. For years, they've been after the board to have the name Langevin removed, but were shut down. APTN interviewed grade eight students, Joy McCullough and Zach Helfenbaum in April. It makes me feel sad that like to this day, there's still like a school that was named after someone like that. It, if I were indigenous and I had to walk into a school that had something like this name, I'd feel very sad and angry. In a statement, the Board of Education said the tragic discovery in Kamloops and the reaction shared by Canadians has emphasized the importance of reconciliation. Kat Schick of the renaming committee says although the students have been turned down in the past, now is the time to remove names like Langevin. It's exactly the right time to do it, to um, show the public that there are people here that care about reconciliation, that care about survivors and victims of residential schools, and care that our institutions are named after people who actually promoted this horrible institution. Riverside School was the original name before being changed to Langevin. The Calgary Board of Education says it will be considering changes to policies regarding renaming at a meeting later this month.
Tamara Pimentel, ABTN National News, Calgary. Good to hear from the youth there. Still to come, we'll check in on the coroner's inquest into the de death of Joyce Eshaquan. And the Native Women's Association goes its own way on an action plan into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. That meant we were shut out of the major decision-making process that were intended to create the plan. Welcome back. The Echequan Commission in Trois-Rivières is gradually winding down. With witness interrogations over, the Quebec coroner is now hearing expert recommendations from both Indigenous and medical stakeholders. Lindsay Richardson brings us the latest on what's being said. The waterfront city known today as Trois-Rivières is unceded Atikamekw territory. Nations gathered here for centuries. That's still the case today, with experts flocking in to partake in the last 48 hours of the Echequan Commission. Nos recommandations ont été beaucoup la, la formation, euh, même des lois à l'intérieur euh, sur le contrer le racisme et la, la discrimination, les préjugés, etc. Viviane Michel, president of Quebec Native Women, was the first to issue recommendations to commission leaders late last week, and accountability was on the agenda. Si, exemple, un employé est témoin justement des propos raciaux ou euh, euh, vraiment déshumanisants envers une, une patiente autochtone, c'est aussi que euh, on puisse protéger aussi ces personnes-là qui veulent dénoncer. This week, Inu surgeon Stanley Volant told the court Joyce Echequan's death at Joliet Hospital reinforced existing fears. He's pushing for cultural security and multidisciplinary teams in hospitals. Otherwise, quote, there will be others, I'm certain. Manawan Chief Polymill Ottawa agrees. Tout ce que nous demandons, nous, c'est le, le, le droit de vivre dans la dignité. La société québécoise est encore en plein débat concernant le, 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 le droit de mourir dans la dignité. C'est encore des discussions qui ont cours en ce moment. Working with nurses at Manawan's local clinic, Ottawa's recommendations include better accompaniment for patients, mandatory cultural sensitivity training, a 24-7 liaison officer on staff at Joliet Hospital, and better access to medical files. La confiance n'a jamais existé en, en tant que telle. Il faut vraiment l'établir. Il n'est pas question de rétablir quelque chose qui n'existe pas. Alors, euh, c'est vraiment de travailler à, à établir euh, cette confiance, cette confiance qui manque. Et puis, euh, et puis il faut vraiment, euh, ça passe par des changements structurels, par des changements de culture, par de, des changements organisationnels et par des changements d'attitude. Carrying the staff for the Atikamekw Nation, Grand Chief Constant Awashish repeated the need for Quebec to formally support Joyce's principle, previously rejected by the province because it recognizes systemic racism. That's what it is, the uh, principle of Joyce. I think we need to give Canadians and Quebecers a, a better education and better awareness on First Nation. And yes, there's the word uh, systemic racism in there, but I think if we open our eyes, uh, Systemic racism is not only uh, in the NAC, it's way beyond that. Tomorrow is the last day of the Echequan Commission, and we'll be hearing closing remarks from the panel of lawyers who were tasked with cross-examining witnesses as part of this process. But by noon, we're expecting hundreds of people from Manawan and other communities in Quebec to assemble at a nearby park for one last vigil, one last rallying cry of justice for Joyce before the commission officially ends and the wait for the Quebec coroner's report then begins. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News. Trois-Rivières, Quebec. Big day there tomorrow. Well, the second anniversary of the final report from the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is approaching. Foremost among the 231 calls for justice is the establishment of a national action plan. But today, the Native Women's Association of Canada announced they're walking away from the federal process of developing that plan. Jimmy Pashagumscum has more. We were clearly an afterthought and perhaps even an unwelcome intruder in the government's process. 
The process Native Women's Association's President Lorraine Whitman is referring to is the creation of a national action plan to implement the MMIWG inquiries 231 calls for justice. Whitman says their input was not valued by the federal government. That meant we were shut out of the major decision-making process that were intended to create the plan. In addition, on the committees there that we were permitted to sit at, we were subjected to lateral violence and hostility. It eventually reached levels that forced us to walk away. As Prime Minister Justin Trudeau alluded to on Monday, the two-year anniversary of the inquiry's final report is approaching. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to invest and partner uh, with uh, Indigenous communities and activists to make sure uh, that we are responding and ending this, this violence that continues to, uh, uh, to run unchecked in too many parts of the country. Also frustrated with the slow federal response and calling for immediate action is Martha Martin, the mother of Chantel Moore. Moore was shot and killed by police in Edmonston, New Brunswick last year. The anniversary of her death is just days away on June 4th. Martin says Indigenous people need to stand up and work for change. Indigenous people that have been killed, you know, numerous, you know, time and time again, you know, it just feels like our, you know, there's no end to our, our hurting. And then it just, you know, it continues to, to keep happening to Indigenous people, you know. In a statement, the Office of Indigenous Crown Relations says they intend to release the National Action Plan on Thursday and responded to NWAC's claims with, there is much more work to do. We are greatly appreciative of NWAC's work from past engagement efforts, value their input to date, and will continue to work with them through the Canada NWAC Accord. But NWAC says they intend to take things into their own hands. They listed 65 steps they will undertake to end genocide against Indigenous women, including the creation of resiliency lodges, which will be places of healing and empowerment, provide training, education, and entrepreneurial support for Indigenous women to break from the bonds of financial dependency, and a program that has already started, which are art workshops to foster healing and economic opportunities. Jamie Pashagumska, APTN National News, Ottawa. And of course, we'll have plenty of coverage of the release of that national action plan. To election news now, in the Métis Nation Saskatchewan's election last weekend pitted two heavyweights against each other for the president's job. Métis National Council President Clem Cartier took a leave of absence to run against incumbent Glenn McCallum. Cartier lost. McCallum garnered 1,672 votes. Cartier just uh, 1,459 votes. McCallum was in the crosshairs of Cartier and David Chartrand of the Manitoba Métis Federation, as McCallum is a supporter of the Métis Nation of Ontario, which had been sanctioned by the Métis National Council for its citizenship rules. Cartier says he will now go back to being president of the MNC. Coming up after the break, we'll take you to a special celebration. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And our very own Jordan Hasselbeck took this photo of a memorial in Whitehorse as people countrywide continue to react to the discovery at a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. And you can keep your photos coming by sending your images to share at aptn.ca. Tune in to see if our next photo of the day is yours. Time now to take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 21 under the sun for St. John's, 25 in Halifax. Plus one with a chance of snow in Inukshuak, chance of snow in five in Kujuak. 27 in Montreal, showers, and 23 for Shibugamu. 25 and sunny in Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay. 24 under the sun for Thunder Bay, showers and 26 in Sioux Lookout. 13 with rain in Churchill, showers and 21 in God's Lake. 29 for Winnipeg, Brandon and Gimli. 
31 in Regina and Saskatoon, 32 for North Battleford, 21 in Uranium City, 31 for Meadow Lake. In Northern Alberta, 29 for Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie, 34 under the sun in Medicine Hat, 33 and sunny for Lethbridge, 22 in Victoria, 23 for Vancouver, 15 with showers in Dease Lake, rain in 25 in Prince George. 10 in Old Crow, showers in 16 for Whitehorse. 21 partly cloudy in Yellowknife, 16 in Norman Wells. Zero with snow in Saks Harbor, plus one with snow for Polituck. Three in Arviette, zero for Chesterfield. Minus three in Resolute, plus one with snow in Joe Haven. In Saskatchewan, a big virtual gathering took place with hundreds of students and community members celebrating First Nations culture. APTN's Priscilla Wolf has the story. It was a lot of fun filming it. Here's this is 14-year-old Maren Norton, a grade 9 student from the English River First Nation. She participated in an online powwow that took place with over 40 schools in the Prince Albert area. Marin, who danced his fancy shawl, was excited to be a part of the pre-recorded part of the virtual gathering. I was one of the participants in the documentary for the Heart of Thieves powwow, and it was a lot of fun filming it, like seeing a bunch of people and seeing them dance and just getting back into the regalia was nice. Um, Narrating was a fun was fun too. Since 2018, the Prince Albert School Boards have been holding the annual powwow on the last Friday of May. They weren't able to hold one last year because of the pandemic. Elder Liz Satie says it was important to do something this year for the youth. That's why they took it virtual. Some of them are just scared to acknowledge um, their their indigenous part. And, and that just hurts my heart because we need to be proud of who we are and we need to hold our heads up. We have so much to offer and our youth are so gifted and so talented. Delphine Melchard, who sits on the planning committee, says the idea was to give online viewers the sense that they were at a powwow. So what they're going to see is the process of uh, what, what is it like to attend a powwow? Uh, even though they can't be there in person, they're going to get a taste of everything that happens at a powwow, plus some behind-the-scenes things that you wouldn't see if you went to a powwow. People can still access the online virtual powwow on YouTube. It's titled Heart of the Youth Powwow 2021. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. Hopefully we'll all be gathering together in real life for real soon. That's all the time we have for this Tuesday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and never miss a story by downloading the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for joining us. Take care and have a great night.